As you know, this is how the first movement begins in the atmosphere of brooding. One of my students asked me, why should we practice scales and arpeggios? Here is an answer. Some of the greatest moments in music are nothing but a scale or arpeggio, in this case an F minor arpeggio. The right hand has an octave leap at the end of this arpeggio. But the left hand keeps on climbing, which makes it terrifyingly dark and slimy. Now this is like a warning, this trio. No matter how many millions of times this work has been performed, each time you play this, you are involved with something most wonderful, life-shattering and meteor crashing. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Mami at New Tips Piano Series. I thought I want to talk about rhythm today. It's one thing I have not talked about in my past videos and it's the most fundamental thing in music. You cannot be a great musician without a good sense of rhythm. Dr. Craig Wright says, rhythm is platonic meta-reality of music. Which I thought sounded really cool, whatever it means. Anyway, I thought we are going to focus on Beethoven's famous appassionata sonata in this episode because having strong rhythmic integrity is particularly essential in Beethoven playing, perhaps more than any other composers. And also I learned recently that a lot of the first movement of this sonata was originally sketched in 4-4 time signature and not in 12-8. I could not get this information anywhere on the internet and I'm grateful to Chris Worsley for providing me with this information. I was amazed that something as famous as Appassionata and there's still information you couldn't find by googling on the internet. I was so excited to learn about this original time signature and I wanted to share it with you. There was a convention at the time of playing dotted rhythms like triplets. In Schubert's music, for instance, there are often discussions of triplet assimilation, that is you adapt dotted rhythms into triplets. So you play with accompaniment like this. Beethoven clearly did not want people to play the theme of this appassionata like a triplet. Not like that, but... By rewriting it in 12-8, he made it quite clear that he wanted the semiquaver to come after the third quaver in the accompaniment. Not like a triplet. I get disappointed when I hear people play like that, actually. The second theme is closely related to the first subject, even though the mood is completely different. It's full of hope, but it's got the same rhythm, also an arpeggio but inverted. And we must make this rhythmic connection audible. At Pew Allegro, towards the end of the first movement, the second theme is presented in the minor. The first theme and the second theme kind of overlap. At the very end, behind the storm, we see the ghost of the theme surface before sinking behind the horizon again, and we realize, actually, the first theme and the second theme are the same. The heroic aspirations and black despair are opposite sides of the same coin. And if you play the second theme with a different and less sharp rhythm, the meaning is lost.
you can spend a lot of time analyzing the harmonies of this piece or any other Beethoven sonatas, and of course that is of utmost importance. For instance, the Neapolitan harmony which keeps coming back, and it is a framework of the piece. But however strongly you feel the harmonies, if your rhythm is not taught, then I think you miss the point and fail to get to the heart of this music. I really believe that. The second subject holds the key to the understanding of this work. How this theme emerges after the ominous and oppressive opening and some angry outbursts and agonizing cries like... Now comes this beautiful tune, an appearance of the hero, and how Beethoven prepares for this moment. This sign figure... This is a crochet, another crochet, but it gets longer. And up here it's got this pointed sign. But as you go down the keyboard, it gets longer and kind of defrost into this warm tune. It's a glorious moment, but what happens to this beautiful vision is just shocking and brutal. It's not allowed to carry on singing, but it's denied. And this bleak sound, which can be achieved by bringing out the top note. This is absolutely heartbreaking and this moment summarizes the tragedy of the whole work. If it was a film, the devastating outcome is shown near the beginning and the rest of the film exists to confirm it, slowly moving towards the inevitable destruction. Yes, there are moments of great drama and defiance and heroism, especially when the bass rises and rises and rises in the development section of the first movement, which is the most exciting thing. But the tragic outcome was stated very near the beginning and there's no escape from it. I think that's why this sonata is considered the most King Lear-ish of all Beethoven sonatas, for there's no hope and you go mad in the head. Now this is a study in legato. It's like a meteor approaching the earth and hitting it like you. Whenever I perform this bit, I feel like my entire being is hanging on this thin streak of thread. I think the worst thing you can do to spoil this moment is to change the tempo. It's relaxing as you do the trio C. And you're playing in a free manner. But if you think about it, if you can change and control the speed of a meteor hitting the earth at your will, then the excitement is lost. In this scenario, it's scary because you're powerless to change its course. It's preordained and it's going to be a disaster. But how do we keep in time? Listening to the inner rhythm gives the sense of urgency and makes the playing more compelling when everything is in the right place. Emerging out of the development section at the start of the recapitulation halfway through the piece, we hear this insistent knocking sound in the bass. I hear this sound in my mind from the very beginning before playing the first note. It 
comes to the fore in this bar, bar 134, and we become aware of it at that moment. But in fact, this thing has been there from the very beginning. It's like a ticking bomb set right at the start, the hidden thread going through the whole piece. You might think this is just a fancy talk, and I know I have the tendency to fall for grandiose ideas. I recently watched a 2007 film called The Mist with a very shocking ending, and I thought that was a cynical take on heroism, and it's a stark reminder against going for glory, and then one should not be a hero. I think that's the message of the film. I was telling my student about this only the other day, warning him against kind of overzealous approach to performance as it can be fatal. Quite often, the worst thing you can do is try and force the best performance and you should kind of step back on stage. Having said that, playing something like this, Opus 57 of Beethoven, one of the greatest summits of the whole of the Western music, there's no room for cynicism, I don't think. Only a total commitment and conviction will do. No matter how many millions of times this work has been performed, each time you play this you are involved with something most wonderful, life-shattering and meteor-crashing. The hallmark of my teaching is that I change what I say all the time and I'm not ashamed of that because learning and growing means to change. Now this leads to the second movement of this sonata with its unchanging harmonies which Torbe describes as a dream that must be shattered at the first hint of action for it cannot move away from the harmonies of its theme. Isn't it beautifully said? I love that. This movement is a theme and variations. As Torbe says, the harmonies stay much the same in each variation. The movement has to remain a beautiful vision that cannot be realized because the only truth of life is change. Things that cannot change must remain a dream. Now with this we conclude part one and this episode continues on to the next episode but I've made a little bonus feature explaining Beethoven's ornaments so if you're interested please watch on. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you in part two and don't forget to subscribe. Bye! This is the beginning of the first movement and in bar three there's a figure I described like a warning. And notice that the little ornament preceding the trio is omitted on the fourth one. So to begin with, there's a little note. But as the danger comes closer and more desperate, the grace note disappears. As a footnote, I would start the trio from the main note when there's nothing written down because Beethoven writes a grace note when he wants the trio to start from the note above such as in that bar.